Politics Nation with Reverend Al Sharpton starts right now. Good evening, Rev. Good evening, Ed. And thanks to you for tuning in. Tonight's lead, the retrial of Michael Dunn. As lawyers for both sides get ready for what could be a second murder trial, we're learning more about what Dunn was thinking and saying while he was in jail. New re newly released phone calls and letters reveal some disturbing comments Dunn made after he shot and killed Jordan Davis. Dunn repeatedly says he fired in self-defense and insisted he was the victim. Here's part of one phone call to his fiance. I'm the victim here. I was the one that was being preyed upon, and I fought back. Right. And, and then, you know, it's not quite the same, but it made me think of, like, the old TV shows and movies where, um, like, how the police used to think when a chick got raped. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, it's her fault because the way she was dressed. Right. You know, and I'm like, so so it's my fault because I asked him to turn their radio down. He's comparing himself to a rape victim who was blamed for what happened. And that wasn't the only time he called himself a victim. You know, I, I was thinking about that today. I was like, I'm the f victim here. I was the one who was victimized. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, how, how I'm to put it. It's like, they attacked me. I, I'm the victim. Right. I'm the victor, but I was the victim, too. I'm the victor, but I was the victim, too. What about Jordan Davis, who would have turned 19 years old this week? Jordan's parents certainly think he's the victim in this case. And here's what Dunn said about his fellow inmates. So being in a, a room by myself kind of sucks, but I, would, I guess it'd be better than being in a room with them animals. Well, you know, they probably wouldn't think too highly about what, what's going on, and so it is best, but I can only imagine. He called the other people in jail animals, and that's not all. In a letter from jail, Dunn wrote, quote, we were talking about how racist the blacks are up here. The more time I'm exposed to these people, the more prejudiced against them I become. And quote, this gangster rap ghetto talking thug culture that certain segments of society flock to is intolerable. These phone calls and letters are shocking, but none of them were part of the trial. The judge ruled they were irrelevant because they came after the shooting. But prosecutors say they'll pursue a new trial. Does that mean we could see a new ruling? What about new arguments, new strategies? How will both sides adjust to a new jury? Joining me now are former prosecutor Faith Jenkins, Florida criminal defense lawyer Ken Padowitz, and former prosecutor Marsha Clark. She's also the author of Killer Ambition. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. Thank you. Faith, let me go to you first. L lawyers may understand why the judge would, would not let jurors see these letters and hear these phone calls, but to regular everyday people, it seems to defy common sense. Can you explain this, why the judge wouldn't let the jurors hear and, and read this? Yes, well, prior to the trial, Dunn's attorney, Corey Strola, actually filed a motion called a motion in limine to actually address these issues with the judge and try to keep all of these statements and phone call calls out of court. He said that they were too inflammatory, they would be unfairly prejudicial, and it would be impermissible character evidence against Michael Dunn. And so the judge looked at all of the evidence, looked at the statements, and essentially made a, a judgment call here. Uh, the prosecutors argued that these statements went to Michael Dunn. Dunn's state of mind even on the night of the shooting when he used the term thug music before he started shooting. So they argue that these statements were evidence of uh, a certain racial animus and bias that he held and so therefore they wanted to use them. So the judge ruled that the prosecutors could use some statements and not others um, and they gave them an opportunity to perhaps uh, use them on cross-examination if Dunn took the witness stand and testified and somehow opened the door. But um, in the end the judge decided that allowing all 
all of that evidence in would probably be unfairly prejudicial, and he went and erred on the side of caution and not having this be an issue that could be brought up on appeal, essentially. Marsha, uh, other quotes from letters that Dunn wrote from jail that are now public is he says, quote, this jail is full of blacks and they all act like thugs. Another quote, this may sound a bit radical, but if more people would arm themselves and kill these idiots when they're threatening you, eventually they may take the hint and change their behavior. Arm themselves and kill these idiots, uh, Marsha. Uh, don't comments yes. like this shed some light on Dunn's state of mind when he shot and killed Jordan Davis, who was not armed? That would certainly be my argument, Reverend. Uh, this shows a state of mind that is actually helpful to prove premeditation. It, it might even be a state of mind helpful to prove a hate crime. And perhaps the prosecution will rethink the charges that they bring. If they go back and they go for a retrial, they can add charges, especially, you know, if they follow Florida procedure and add a hate crime. This seems to indicate that there is some basis for it. But at a bare minimum, it certainly does show a state of mind that is highly relevant to the issue of premeditation and deliberation. They, everybody should arm themselves and kill these thugs. And he's talking about thug music. And let's not forget, he's the one who provoked this co this confrontation. When I hear him say he was a victim, excuse me, uh, you're the one, sir, who went over to the car and started complaining about the music. They didn't go to you. So don't talk to me about a victim and certainly don't compare yourself to a rape victim. Now, Ken, uh, uh, this young man just uh, uh, was, 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 was unarmed as far as we know, of course we were. Uh, of course, we are told by Mr. Dunn that he had a gun. No one ever found a gun. No one corroborated a gun, and he never told anyone, including his fiance, about a gun. So how he comes back as a victim, we don't know. Prosecutors charged Dunn with first-degree murder, but they needed in charging him with first-degree murder to prove premeditated design to cause the death and convince 12 people of the jury of that. For second-degree murder, they need to show proof of depraved mind, but no premeditation. And in Florida, there would have only been six people on the jury. Should Angela Curry change the charge to just the second-degree murder or manslaughter? Well, the state attorney in Jacksonville, Angela Corey, held a press conference, and she defended her charges in this case from the grand jury and defended the first-degree murder charge. You know, she can defend all she wants. This isn't open to argument anymore. It's already settled. Twelve people sitting on a jury sent her a message. We might as well put it in blinking lights in Times Square in New York. That message is count two, count three, count four. We're not buying attempted first-degree murder. We're coming back lesser. We find a reasonable doubt on attempted first-degree murder. And so they came back with the lesser crime, the lesser included offense of attempted second-degree murder. So the message is clear. The, the state attorney's office in Jacksonville overcharged this case. They could have charged second-degree murder. They would have gotten a conviction for second-degree murder. And the jury's already sent the verdict and the message to Angela Corey, you've overcharged on counts two, three, and four. We're coming back attempted second-degree murder, not attempted first-degree murder that you got an indictment for. So it's clear here. Angela Corey is probably not going to change the charges at this point in time. She's going to maintain that she made no error, and she's right. going to go forward on the charges that were originally placed before this jury. Now, Faith, uh, State Attorney Angela Corey did say she hopes to speak with some of the jurors. Watch this. You all heard the judge say the jurors are at liberty to speak with whomever they please. So we hope to hear from them on what, what we could do better. We frequently have had cases where a juror will call the office and say, I'd like to tell you what we talked about back there. Now, now how could talking with the jury uh, and the jurors affect where she goes in the second case, Faith? Well, you have another opportunity here, basically a second bite at the apple to get justice for Jordan Davis. So they should absolutely talk to the jurors jurors, and find out what the hang-up was for this hung jury. Did some jurors actually buy into and credit Dunn's story of self-defense? Or is it perhaps, as what Ken just discussed, a was it a discussion or a debate between first degree, second degree, or manslaughter? So you want to get into the minds of those jurors, find 
find out where the conflict was, what was the reason that they couldn't come to an agreement, why did the jury hang on that top count, and make a decision and, and perhaps adjust your strategy going forward into the second trial. Marshall, uh, I'd be very interested in your uh, thoughts on this. You've been a prosecutor. Would you try it again on murder one, or would you drop to murder two, or would you have stayed at murder two in the first place? Um, Reverend, I would, I would certainly proceed with murder one. I think that there is ample evidence here for murder one. I disagree with Ken. I don't think that the verdict finding attempted second-degree murder is a dismissal of the first, uh, the murder in the first degree, because the intent is different. The intent that he had with respect to Davis, the actual victim and the one that he fought with, is one thing. The intent that he had with respect to the others in the car, whom he confronted belatedly and probably didn't realize were there, um, is a different thing. The fact that the jury did not acquit quit him of first-degree murder is telling. I'd like to know what the count was. I'd like to know how the jury hung. Was it 11 to 1 for acquittal on first degree? Was it 11 to 1 for conviction on first degree? We don't know that. But the fact that the jury left the first degree on the table and did not acquit him of it is, to me, um, evidence that they should proceed with it. I certainly would. Now, Ken, what do you think the defense will do differently? If you were defending Dunn, what would you do differently? Well, they're definitely going to do the same exact thing the prosecutors are going to do. They're going to wait to hear and see if any of the jurors speak up, if they give a window to both the prosecution and the defense as to what was going on in that jury room and in the minds of the jurors, what evidence was important to them, what cross-examination or direct was important, what was said in opening statements during, during the trial that they hung on to or that they rejected. So all these things a good defense attorney is going to examine closely if one of the jurors speak out in public and tell us what was going on in there. And they're going to dissect their case and adjust it accordingly if they get that information. Faith, the uh, state attorney, Corey, has said, quote, we intend to fully push for a trial right here in Jacksonville, Duval County, Florida. Uh, everyone in Jacksonville knows about the case. Everyone in Duval County knows about the case and probably has an opinion. Should she move for change in venue for the next uh, uh, trial, for the retrial? You know, it's something that she will consider, and I'm sure that it, Corey Strola will consider it as well, because the ultimate question will be, can they find jurors that will be fair and impartial and decide the case based on the evidence in spite of all the media coverage? And that's going to be the judge's decision, and up to the judge to use his discretion in determining that. Um, if she has the confidence that there are people in the community that can come in, listen to the evidence, listen to the arguments, and they need to be really careful in jury selection this, this next time around. They have an opportunity here to really vet these jurors. They know now that there are going to be some issues that come up, some stereotypes and, and some a narrative that's going to be formed by the defendant to these jurors. They need to be very careful now in selecting jurors this next time around. If they believe that they can get jurors that will be fair and impartial and decide the case based on the evidence, which is overwhelmingly in favor of the prosecution, then they have no reason to leave Jacksonville in that county. Faith Jenkins, Marsha Clark, and Ken Padowitz, thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, fighting to stop the injustice of Stand Your Ground. Will Michael Dunn's mistrial finally end this unfair law? And a deeper look at our criminal justice system. We'll talk live to a man freed after six years in prison for shooting a man who attacked him with a knife. Why didn't the jury accept his claim of self-defense? Also, big developments in the Christie Bridge scandal. I'll talk to the lawmaker leading the investigation. And my meeting with President Obama and civil rights leaders today. What we are doing to advance the dream. It's a big show ahead. Stay with us. shows and movies where, um, like, how the police used to think when a chick got raped, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, it's her fault because the way she was dressed. Right. Yeah, you know, and I'm like, so, so it's my fault because I asked him to turn their idiot. <laughs> he was the victim. Here's part of one phone call to his fiance. I'm the victim here. I was the one that was being preyed upon, and I fought back. Right. 
And, and then, you know, it's not quite the same, but it made me think of like the old... Dunn was thinking and saying while he was in jail. New re newly released phone calls and letters reveal some disturbing comments Dunn made after he shot and killed Jordan Davis. Dunn repeatedly says he fired in self-defense and insisted... Politics Nation with Reverend Al Sharpton starts right now. Good evening, Rev. Good evening, Ed, and thanks to you for tuning in. Tonight's lead, the retrial of Michael Dunn. As lawyers for both sides get ready for what could be a second murder trial, we're learning more about what he's comparing himself to a rape victim who was blamed for what happened. And that wasn't the only time he called himself a victim. You know, I, I was thinking about that today. I was like, I'm the victim here. I was 